Hey everyone, and thanks for joining us for another episode of the Rabbit Dog's House, where we like to discuss lost or forgotten horror gems. I'm your host, Justin Steele, and tonight we are going to be discussing the 2001 thriller horror film, Joyride. Directed by John Dahl and written by J.J. Abrams and Clay Tarver. Joyride stars Paul Walker, Lily Sobieski, and Steve Zahn. Paul Walker is Lewis, a young man who purchases a car in order to road trip home from college with his longtime crush, Venna. On the way, he picks up his prankster brother, Fuller, who is sort of the black sheep of the family. Fuller goads Lewis into playing a prank on a trucker named Rusty Nail that leads to disastrous consequences, and soon, the trio is forced to learn their lesson or die. Joyride is still a fun and thrilling road trip riot full of laughter and chills. Also joining me tonight is my very special guest star, Zena Dixon. Thanks again, everybody, for joining us for another episode of The Rabbit Dog's House. With me is my very special guest star, the real queen of horror, Zena Dixon. How you doing tonight, Zena? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing really well. Super excited to talk about Joyride with you. Um, I feel like getting to know you, we've had, a, we've had a chance to... We love a lot of the same stuff, but we've also gotten to see some different things from each other. Like, I'd always wanted to see Summer of Fear... But getting talk, getting to talk to you kind of pushed me to finally see it. And, you know, I was shocked, as apparently were many Twitter followers, that you had not seen Joyride. And I'm so glad that, like, I got to get you to kind of push to watch it. Because, I, you know, it's one of those movies, I came to it, I saw the end of it first before I saw the beginning of it, which is funny because it has so many alternate endings and it could have gone so many different ways. But the beginning of that movie, even knowing how it's going to end, they really did a good job, I feel like, structuring it in a way that you're captivated. But yeah, my roommate, Danielle, she was obsessed with the movie. In particular, she had a crush on Paul Walker, but she was enamored of Steve Zahn's humor in the movie. I think he's hilarious. Uh, the, the prankster, but also like there's a one line where he's like, you really scared us back there. And she used to rewind that over and over again. So I've seen this movie a dozen times, but I remember watching it myself and getting the DVD of it. And on the back of the DVD, it said, you know, the 28 minute alternate ending. So I saw in the special features, all the like little alternate endings, but I had to do, you know, it was my first experience with Easter eggs. And you have that little joyride thing comes up and you click on it. And it was probably like months and months after I owned the movie that I finally saw. Because on the back of the DVD, he's in like a, a police officer's jacket, uh, yeah. Fuller's character and stuff. So I remember being like, that's not in there. I'm like, there's something I'm not finding here. Finally saw it. I really enjoyed the alternate ending as well. I think that they're both really good personally and you know i usually when i watch an alternate ending sometimes i am kind of like oh i kind of wish that's the direction they had gone or this or that i do think and we'll get into it personally that they went the right way with the theatrical ending i think it, it it's more of a balance to like the i feel like the first half of the movie is structured to be like and spoiler spoiler spoilers as always it goes it's like the first half of that movie is getting up to the hotel room and the prank and the sequence and then the rest second half of the movie is also leading up to this hotel room sequence again i feel like it just kind of balances well but uh, we were talking beforehand and i want to hear how you came into this but i also um side notes you know we talk about you know horror and thriller movies and what is what and difference and you know personally i you know i think it's all under the umbrella of horror and joyride fits under that whether it's thriller psychological thriller science fiction they all kind of blend up to that but um you know i know the director said that and jj abrams behind the scenes they all said they set out to make this thriller movie and, and what that meant to them was you know not a lot of gore not a lot of you know violence and i think they succeeded if that was their goal again i still would categorize it as a horror movie but as a goal yes it's it's it doesn't rely on a lot of gimmicks other than it's a joyful movie you know but the other thing I really appreciate about 2001's Joyride is it came at the end of the Scream era of horror movies. 
these sort of clever, self-aware horror movies. And what I appreciated about Joyride is that it wasn't trying to be another scream, and it wasn't trying to differentiate itself as being this, like, clever, these kids have this heightened dialogue sort of self-aware sense of humor. This is just a straight-laced movie. This is a set out to thrills, scares, some laughs, and, you know, I think it succeeds in that. And it, it's also refreshing to not be another urban legend, The Faculty, you know, Halloween H2O, all those movies that were kind of like, I know what you did last summer, generic. I loved them all, so I use the word generic lightly. But generic rip-offs in a way of Scream, what Scream accomplished. I liked that Joyride dared to be a little different. But tell us, tell us, what did you think of your first time through watching Joyride? Well, okay, so we were talking about this before, so I might repeat myself, obviously. But you know what? I have no idea why I did not watch this movie because it's right up my alley. I think, maybe, perhaps, I probably just thought it was just like a thriller. You know what I mean? Because I remember seeing the poster, and I remember it's it's been on my list to check out. But I wasn't really in a rush. So thank you, you know, uh, for actually, you know, giving me that push, like checking it out. You know, as you said, like, I remember just, you know, saying that on Twitter. And there were like so many people who was just like, what? You never seen it? And it's just like, no, I haven't seen it. it mm-hmm. It's shocking, but I haven't seen it. You know, I, I had no idea what I was missing until I actually watched the movie. So I'll just say, like, I really, really enjoy the movie. I feel like it is the perfect popcorn type of movie. So what I mean by that is if you're someone who loves thrillers, action, suspense, this is for you. If you love horror, this is for you. If you're even a car person, guess what? This is for you, you know? You like comedy, again, this is for you. There's just so much that's packed in, packed into this movie. And then even when you were mentioning about, like, the um, alternate endings, I'm right there with you where it's just like, normally I would be like, man, I would really have loved to have seen this to see how people reacted to that. But I think that they did the right thing. They went the right route with the movie. It just flows. It just fits better. You know, like, I I didn't know that I would feel that way because guaranteed there's like four to choose from. So I'm like, you know, there's going to be one that I probably like more, but not at all. And Again, I feel like even when it when it comes to like the director and everything, it's like he really knows how to like build up the suspense. Because, you know, when the movie opens and, and we meet Lewis and we can we see that he has a crush on, on yeah. Anna, you know, um, you know, it's like obviously he wants to impress a girl and you know, which I'm like, you know what, I'm all for that. That's super cute. He even decides to, you know, rescue his brother, and it's like Fuller is, he's a fun character, but yeah, he probably should have dropped him off. <laughs> you know, when it comes to, to oh, Lewis, yeah. yeah, it's like when it comes to Lewis, I feel like, you know, he is, he's such a good boy. That's just pretty much what it is. You, you, he makes some dumb decisions. I, I don't know what was going on there. And it's like, honestly, out of all the things that these guys could have done during the ride, of had a regular conversation, listen to music, play I Spy With My Eye. I don't know. You know what I mean? Just <laughs> yes. things that people do on road trips. And on top of that, it was 2001. You guys have cell phones. Why don't you just, if you want to make those prank phone calls, then use your phone. You For know, sure. I've, I've always been a little hesitant about those type of things because you never know who you're talking to. Yeah. And, you know, what I think is crazy, and I'm pretty sure we'll, we'll talk about it more, is how Rusty Nail, how he found them, you know, like. Well, I have done I've done some of the clues and stuff like that. So I think it all works. It's all a lot of suspension of disbelief. But I do think that it works. But we can talk about that. But yeah, I think that there is a lot that they could have done. I mean, Fuller is, though, the black sheep of the family. He is the prankster. I mean, let's be honest, this was all his fault. Everything was his fault in the movie. Um. I think, though, like, he just always felt outcasted from his family, so he has to try it. Like, if you think about it, Lewis is sort of the straight-laced brother, the going to college, the good kid, never got in trouble. I think it was Fuller's way to, like, get attention, but he also kind of thrives. He knows that his brother looks up to him, and Lewis does look up to him. Right. And I feel like people like that that are sort of, like, on the straight and narrow road, there's that temptation to do something. And so Fuller, you know, represented that. For him. I agree with you. 
I think something that I'm, I'm happy about is, um, and that I would recommend to someone, say, if you haven't seen this movie before, I would recommend, like, you can read the synopsis if you want, but I would highly recommend do not watch the trailer. I think it's better, like, the less you know, the best. Just go in. And I kind of feel like I went in a little bit blind because I would always see that poster where, you know, um, there's, like, three of them, you know, yeah. kind of, you know, and then you see, like, the truck and then there's a car and silhouette, you know, kind of thing. So, you know, I kind of knew it was going to be, you know, something to do with, like, a, a chase kind of thing. And then on top of that, you know, Paul Walker, he was really into cars, you know. So, oh, yeah. You know, it just, I felt like this, like, really fit him. Absolutely. Well, I will, as we kind of segue, I will just capping on what you said about, like, you're right. There is, like, a suspension of disbelief. Like, how does Rusty now find them continuously? Who, by the way, is the voice from Silence of the Lambs, the the Buffalo Bill, the, yes. you know, a little, you know uh, I don't know if I get away with that online. What is it? Um, It puts the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose. You know, that voice, the, put the fucking lotion on the basket, <laughs> you know, <laughs> But there's a fun feature on the DVD where you can listen to, there were two other people that were doing the voiceover work. So you can hear the comparisons between this version of Rusty Nail versus this one. And then Ted Levine is his name who did it. Um, but I, you know, I have seen this movie dozens of times now and everything does, you know, if you think about it, like he, find, he saw their car in the parking lot of right. the hotel on the first yeah. prank. And then they're the ones, they, they got pulled off by the police and got pulled back and he saw they were in the next room. So he could follow them that way. And then, you know, he, when they, we never see after the fact, like they pull out after the first attack um, with the ice truck and all that, they pull out and then he follows them um, to Vena basically to there. And he must have grabbed Charlotte along the way. Right. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, it's, there's a couple of things where it's like too far stretched, but as a first time through, especially like you said, going in blind though, you're in for a fun ride. I think no pun intended. Like it, it's fun. There's some laughs. There's some chills. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. Um, I think the performances are really good. You know, I think like Paul Walker really plays Lewis. Well, uh, Steve Zahn has that goofy sort of persona, charming sometimes, sometimes annoying, but it works for the character. Lily Sobieski, we were talking about before, um, you know, I really liked her as Venom. She always reminded me of like a mini Helen Hunt or a younger Helen Hunt. But uh, you had mentioned, well, Never Been Kissed is a movie that I definitely loved her in. And you reminded me of The Glass House when we were talking before this. And she was fantastic in that movie. Okay. Love that movie. Um, I also was a big fan of her in a movie called Here on Earth. It was such a syrupy teen drama y sort of thing in like the year 2000 but i was just graduating high school i really liked the soundtrack and she was fantastic in it but the glass house was a really really good movie that i think a lot of people forget about mm -hmm. but we might have to do an episode on that because i feel like that's a forgotten or lost sort of horror gem out there but yeah what did you think about the performances you know I, do you think they worked i really do feel like it like it worked and that was something i i meant to say like i it's obviously Joyride, it is a watchable movie, but on top of that, what makes it great is the cast. Yeah. I love the fact that they just, it, they fit. You know, you would think, because, okay, as an example, I always thought that Paul Walker, that he was a great actor, you know? Um, and then, even with, with Lily's character, sometimes, something I noticed with her is, well, especially, okay, you see Never Been Kissed. And I remember her character kind of came off a little bit stiff sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. that was her character. But then I remember watching um, Glass House and she was kind of like that certain scenes, but then not really. And then in this one, she's a little bit like that, but it works. You know what I mean? Like that's her personality. And I yeah. love the fact that she has some layers to her. You know, she's not like, oh, what's going on? You know, like all, you know the girls, <laughs> like without me. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> she seems like she has some layers. You know, she has like a, a good head on her shoulders. And you even understand why Lewis 
has a crush on her, you know? And Absolutely. so this is brother, apparently. So, you know, well, you they just... were originally going to, you know, there was supposed to be a plot line. If you watch, like, there's, again, if there's the deleted scenes and stuff that are on the thing, but there's a scene where Fuller does kiss him, yes, kiss her, yes, you I know, stuff. and I think originally, okay, and it is, I'm glad they cut it because I would really, he walks that fine line, Steve's on as this character, but with that scene, I don't think there's coming back from it. He doesn't go too far, but it's creepy enough. And um, but but like they kind of you can see why, like you said, they would be attracted to her. And that the movie was originally set up to be they kind of were filming it in a way of like, is she gonna choose Lewis's character? And they did takes where they she kind of went more for Fuller's character. You know, and I always thought that was kind of interesting. I think they went with the right choice in having it be more with Lewis. But Lily Sobieski, she does walk that line, too, of, like... Like, I think she's the type of actress who, like... Or her character is the type of character that's, like... Instead of, like, an actor saying the lines that they know are funny, she says the lines like a real person who first thinks of something funny and then realizes it's funny as she's saying it. So it kind of comes out stiff... But that's more how people are in real life. Exactly. So I think that that kind of, you know, goes with that. I agree with you. And something I was going to ask you, um, so I wasn't too sure how I, I felt about it. Like, we, we kind of, like, danced around it a little bit. But how do you feel uh, about, like, the prank, what they did? Oh, I mean, well, <clears throat> I think it comes down to what, keeping with Lily Sobieski, what she says... So there's the scene where their butts are butt, you know, you see the butts. And she's talking to him on the sort of CB radio. And I, you know, she basically says sometimes people don't think about what they say or what they're doing, you know, how their actions can hurt other people. And I think that that's kind of the message of this movie, kind of like what we talked about with Lisa in a way where you don't know who you're talking to. Right. It's kind of like, at fir- and it's a weird play, just like Lisa was, it's a weird play on that, where at first you're kind of like in the, pos- you feel bad. I mean, you, I think you kind of have an idea in the back of your mind where it's going, but to as much as you can, you feel bad for Rusty now. And mm-hmm. you're like, man, he doesn't know who he's talking to. Lewis is pretending to be a girl. And then, but then obviously, but those boys, so it's sort of like this ironic prank where then it becomes on them because they they think they're doing this, but it's really the other side with Rusty now that you don't know that you've pranked this homicidal maniac who rips people's jaws off. And I will say one of the alternate endings, I forgot, there's a scene, because you know, in the co- he put that guy in the coma who was a total douche, oh but he put God. that guy in a coma by ripping off his jaw. And in one of the deleted se- alternate endings, he tries doing that with Lewis. He puts his hand in his mouth, which is kind of like, I guess, his trademark thing. They didn't go into it, and you almost forget about it. But of all the alternate endings, I wouldn't have minded if that had been there, because it does seem like it's a horrifying thing. So you're putting right. their hand yes. in your mouth and doing that. But anyway, the prank itself, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, I did pranks when I was a kid. Nothing that involved somebody going to do something mm-hmm. or, you know, had that sort of a level of involvement. But, you know, I think that this movie, it no, it was crafted in a way that you could understand why Fuller would want to prank that guy who was a douche. I don't know if YouTube, I'm allowed to say that, but I'm going to see what they do with that. But he, that's the word. He was a douche. He was a douche. You know, he was a jerk. He was... Oh, I hate that type of person. And I worked in the restaurant business for a long time, and I dealt with that kind of person on a regular basis. So I think it was kind of a brilliant prank. It was wrong and immoral, and I don't say that, like, lightly, but I can understand where it was coming from. What do you think about the prank in general? So, I mean, at first, like I said, I, I was just, why can't you just do something else? But all right, sure, fine. For you sure. know, you realize, like you said, that guy, he was a jerk. You know, it was just, I, I really, really do not like people like that at all. So I get where they were coming from. But the thing is, it's like, I have to be honest with you because they, they were in so deep. But I know that, you know, Lewis is such a nice guy that he wanted to tell the police. I would say, I don't know. I don't know what, what happened. And I'll just leave it at that. Because here's the thing. If he is that crazy enough to go to the room, you know, first off, let's take it completely back. Candy Kane did not sound like a woman, okay? That's, he <laughs> did it. he did it. So it's just like, all right, people like to play pranks and stuff like that, but fine, he did go. And then they were hearing all like these weird sounds 
at that point, to be honest with you, you guys could have played Harrow. You know what I mean? You could have went over there. You could have called the cops then, but you didn't. You did it. So it's just like at this point, I know nothing. I know nothing. And I know that's that's horrible. But at this point, I'm thinking to myself, guarantee he would be around. He's lurking. You know, like someone doesn't yeah. just do that. Like they don't even know what he looks like. So that's even scarier because he could be watching. So like you said, and I forgot about that, like that makes perfect sense. And I love the fact that the movie that they don't they don't ever say how he found them. You know, and it was just, but it makes sense that he, like you said, he probably waited outside the hotel room, followed them to the hospital, and then followed them straight on, you know? So, but that's, that's just how I feel about that. You have, the cast is pretty much these three characters, a few secondary characters that pop in for a scene or two, but it's mostly the three in the car. And I think it works well that you have the front half of the movie is it, it crescendos up into this dramatic moment, then it pulls back and it crescendos up in both segments. You're just as interested. I'm interested in the boys dynamic as well as the triangle, et cetera, et cetera. Also, you know, I, what I like about the movie too, is that it, they're grounded in a sort of reality. Like it's like, even in moments where they're scared, like she run, you know, Fuller is like making the moves on Venna in the hotel room. And Lewis is like on the phone. But like Kane Kane or uh, Rusty Nail asks, you know, oh, really, there's no Candy Kane? Well, what is she doing in the room with your brother? So he runs in there and he, they're like freaked out exactly like how I would expect some like 20 year old, 18, 20 year old kids to be. But then he, he even in the midst of his scare his like fear. Lewis is like, then how did he said you were in here with, you know, with her and he makes a pretty good point. Now, why are you in here? You know, it's funny, you know, it's kind of like, but that's what we do in those moments. We have, you know, we don't just have one emotion at a time. We have many. And it's sort of like, that's part of the joy in joy ride. Again, I feel like I'm making little weird puns along the way, but like, that's sort of the joy of it is that I love movies like that. Like we've talked about before how much we appreciate the comedy and horror movies and it it's it's natural it's i feel like it's very natural in this movie they're not forced performances right. um they're comedic in the moments that are funny even if they're scary if you're someone and you you're interested in seeing this movie but you're unsure or just as a push um if someone would have told me this kind of then i probably would have watched it sooner when i after i've watched it the first time i was like oh my gosh this in a way it, it kind of has like um, it's not as original as the Hitcher, but it's like around oh, it. Sure. You know? Yeah. So I feel like oh, that's, yeah. that's one that comes to mind for me, but this one's just more modern and, you know, I, I'm not trying to compare the two because I feel like they're, they're both different because they're both enjoyable, but there was just some, Hitcher was more brutal, you oh. know? So <laughs> I'll never get over that scene with Jennifer Jason Lee. It still haunts me to this wow. day. Nothing, nothing. That's it. Nothing. That's sorry. Fine. Go on. I'm sorry, but no. <laughs> You're fine. But you know, I I was also um one of my friends, he's actually like a really big fan of the series. So I know that there's like a second one and a third one. I was reading up some reviews on the second one and the third one, and people aren't like the aren't biggest fans. People kind of hate them. Um, I can't really speak on it because I haven't seen it, but I'm interested in seeing it just because I I know I really really enjoyed the first one. And you know, sometimes with sequels, they're not that great. But you know, I'm also a completist, so it's like I just feel like now I have to just complete the series. Sure. Uh, you know, I have been, I also have not watched Joyride two or three. I've read a little bit about what they're about, and my hesitation for me because I also I find like even if sequels are terrible, there's moments usually at least one or two you can enjoy in there but right. for me what i've what i've read about it is that there's a lot more like death and killing which is a, a very stereotypical thing for a horror sequel but that's kind of the thing that i love about the the first joyride is that it's not it's not gratuitous it definitely provides you know satisfy right. the horror fan that enjoys a little bit of gore a little bit of like off the line you know humor but as well as scares um, like we're just even joy like Rusty Nail is talking about what they do to unidentified bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a creepy thing to hear. 
But, you know, from what I understand and read about with, like, the second Joyride, I didn't go on to the third one. I mean, it's literally, like, kill, 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 death, death, kill, kill, kill. And that's fine. I have no, like, I'm, you know, that's fine. But for me, what I love about this, about Joyride, is that it isn't that movie. And not because it's being condescending in any way. It's just they want wanted to make a movie that was well-crafted and would give you some thrills and scares, and I think it succeeds. But I do want to make sure we talk about, because it is significant, and it did have some changes, is the theatrical ending versus the alternate ending. I know that we talked about before, and I think in the this actual episode, we both agree that the theatrical ending is the better ending. You know, I feel like they did the other ending, and then they were kind of like, oh, well, what if we had done this? And they're like, well, let's go back and do it. And I think that it was the right choice. Um, if you do notice, though, I made sure to, I've never done this before. I made sure to watch, though, the theatrical cut a little closer because the corn scene and the cornfield was the sort of ending to the right. alternate ending. And I was like, man, they must have either had to refilm everything because Fuller. Steve Zahn's character is wearing that police outfit for most of the corn chase. And if you watch it now, <clears throat> I don't know if you did, but if you watch it now, the theatrical version, you can still see a couple shots where he's still wearing the hat and the jacket. And I never, ever, ever, ever noticed it. Thousands of times I've watched it, even knowing that there was an alternate ending with this, never even thought to look at it. But this time we watched it again Early this week and last night, and last night I was like, oh, there's, he's wearing the jacket. Oh, and he is wearing the black coat versus the sort of tan coat. They should have at least given him in the redo a black coat so they could kind of make sure that that matched or whatever. But anyway, just my overall thoughts on the alternate ending versus the theatrical ending, and then I'd love to hear yours. I feel like the, the alternate ending was a little darker, um, a little bit more like, I don't want to say chaos, but more probably a more natural progression of how if these events in the front half of the movie had happened, probably how it would have gone. Whereas you're just kind of like here, then here, then a cornfield, then things are blowing up. Whereas the theatrical movie is more of a, a crafted, almost as if Rusty Nail had thought this whole thing through. Like it feels like the, the, the alternate ending is almost as if like Rusty Nail is just going on a whim like oh well ben is here now so i'll grab her or oh charlotte's here now i'll grab her oh you know there's a police car whereas in the theatrical version it almost seems more he's more sinister more diabolical because he had this in plan from the moment that he let them go with that ice truck sequence but i also do like that they both hit certain points or stepping stones like the there's the cornfield or the sort of misdirection of the ice, you know, the ice truck man is like, everybody thinks it's him or whatever, or thinks that he's Rusty Nail, et cetera, et cetera. So I like that they kept those ideas, but overall, I definitely prefer the theatrical ending. Loving the Easter egg event of the DVD, though, having it. But what did you think, though? What are your overall thoughts about the theatrical versus the alternate ending? So with the theatrical one, I really like that one. I feel like it kind of just it goes with the flow of the movie. There was all this chaos that was still happening and not saying that it's not as chaotic. It's just a better fit, you know, like, sure. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I in a way I kind of feel like we kind of get like a break, just a little break, you know, which is, which is understandable. But then with the alternate one, like you said, I agree with you 100%. I feel like it is very, very dark, you know, yeah. in a way it's like you guys, that's, this is going to scar you for life. Like this, yeah. a with the alternate one, some horrible things happen, but this will be a story we could tell our kids. It just be yeah. like, and then honestly, even with Fuller, this may be the time where he'll be putting on, like put on a straight arrow, you know, like to straighten yes. up. With that dark one, they're gonna all need counseling. That's that's how I, I felt. Agree. That. I think just to even cement that point a little further, I, I think like with the theatrical ending, they could still all be friends and get over it. I kind of feel like with the alternate ending, they're not getting over it. Like they're not going to be friends probably after this. Like it would be too much. Right. Like almost like it makes it worse to see them as opposed to they bonded throughout this horrifying experience. And I feel like for whatever reason, even with Vena having that shotgun right to her face, oh, I feel like she could get out of that more than being locked up in the truck in the mm -hmm. alternate ending. She seemed like, not doing okay with that right. and yet she seemed more composed 
having the gun there like this i mean she looked terrified and horrified but like she was constantly with like the little pin behind her back trying to like she was worried with the other one i think she was just too helpless but um yeah no I love the theatrical ending, though, in terms of that gun. Like, that still makes me, like, I, I know how it all goes. And I'm still always, like, when he what? yells, when Fuller yells, like, don't open the door, right, yes. as he does it and then falls back. And I love it. It's almost like a ballet. Considering that this was a redo ending, it plays out like a ballet. Like, each moment happens, but it affects another moment, which then, right. happen, like, then that thing happens. Like, Fuller falls on the nail, which a rusty nail you know, it's almost like you would have thought this was how it was always supposed to be. So I'm glad that they, like, realized it. Because who knows if it had had the other ending, if it would have had the same effect. I agree. And I, I guess just the only thing I was going to just say, even with that, is I really do hope that Ben and, and, and Lewis, that they, in my mind, they got married. Too, you know, yeah. they, they live happy and fuller. Is, he's great now. <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a dad and he's he's doing wonderful. So... <laughs> Fuller isn't committing any more pranks. He comes oh. over once a month on Sunday afternoons to barbecue. I would love that ending, you know. <laughs> I think they get through it, you know. But overall, I'm so glad that you did enjoy it. I, I happen to be, I'm their age. So when I was in college, I was a freshman in college when this movie came out. So it, it played in our house and our, like my, our apartment with my roommates all the time. And it was like one of those movies I could watch watch in fact i remember like i probably missed a couple classes because i stayed up till two in the morning watching it and i was but i was like oh i'm starting joyride again and it is great and fun and i think like it was it did well at the time but i feel like in the past 20 years it's starting to like slide from people's memory so i really wanted to do an episode yeah. just kind of putting it back out there give it another watch for people I am such a great idea. Like, thank you again. Like, I'm happy that I finally checked it out. And I can't wait to even show other people this movie. Because That's it, it, I really, really enjoyed it. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us for another episode of The Rabbit Dog's House. What are some of your favorite road trip horror movies like The Hitcher or Road Games, etc.? With me is the lovely Zena Dixon, who you can find over at Wicked Horror. You can find her under her realqueenofhorror.com moniker, also under Real Queen of Horror on YouTube. And I'm Justin Steele. You can also find me on Wicked Horror, Horror and Pop Culture, or on Twitter at Wicked Horror Justin. It was great chatting with you, Zena, and I can't wait to get together next month and do another episode. Thank you so much for an awesome time. We'll see you all soon.